Thanks for joining us. The theme for today is how to attract pollinators to your garden. And planting a, a flower bed like this is a great way to do it because pollinators need flowers and they need nectar. And sometimes you planting a bed like this will help some of the little native species with one more stepping stone to get to the next place and to the next place because there's 20,000 native bee species in the world and some of them only have a really short range of say a couple of hundred meters. So they may not be able to get to the next wild space if we don't have enough flowering things through our urban landscape. So a wonderful thing to do is to plant forage like this. And while it will help a little bit for your European honeybees, it will help more for the native bee species because they really need regular forage throughout the landscape. Purple things are great, that really attracts a lot of bees. You come here certain times of day and you'll see our native blue banded bees here. You'll see our resin bees, you'll see uh, little masked bees and all sorts of native bee species that we have here that are super important. And the way humans have treated the planet, there really isn't enough habitat to sustain not only our our native bee species, but also all sorts of other insects. So we're seeing the sixth mass extinction and it's to do with habitat. So put away the insecticides, get out the habitat, and that's the way we can help save some of these species from the brink of extinction. Another thing you can do is build a pollinator house like this. And we have this launching today. This is our fundraiser where we get pieces of uh, offcuts from the flow hives and we upcycle it into these beautiful little pollinator houses. It's a fun little project. It comes with a tool for, for you to assemble them with your family and you put in these little bamboo tubes. It comes with that as well. This is a great thing to put out in your garden or even better or under some shelter like on the outside wall of your house and that's where I see them go absolutely crazy with uh, pollinators and you'll see pretty soon they'll be filled with different resins and things from resin bees and mud from other species and so on. But for us, it's not about selling this. Even though it's a great thing we do each year, we raise the funds and we give it all the way to, to uh, planting more habitat and advocating for our really important pollinators. But whether or not you want to purchase one of these, which is available today, uh, or build your own, it doesn't matter. The idea is to, to get out there and create some habitat which you can simply do by just leaving wild spaces in your yard, by, by leaving places be. So the, uh, for us, like the blue banded bee, for instance, just wants a little corner left alone, a bit of mud it can build a, a solitary nest in. Because these species don't build colonies like our European honey bee cousin over here. They just need a, a small little place to lay some eggs. So a, a single bee will go in there, lay its eggs, and they will emerge from that one place. And that's what it will do in its life. Super important little pollinators. Now, um, better not forget the honey here. So the European honey bee is, is um, really important to us as well, of course. And here we are with the honey beautifully flowing out. Springtime here, so it's a good idea to empty some of the frames out and make some space in the hive. This is super, super cool. We've got a very dark honey here. Um, look at that, yum. It's dark red, actually. Very cool. We might get another frame going too while I answer some of your questions. So if you've got questions, put it in the comments below. It's our weekly live Q&A. The idea is you ask any questions you like about bees, beekeeping, flow hives, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. So Trace will read those out, put your questions in the bottom, and away we'll go. I might just harvest another one. Now, if you are harvesting your flow frames, a good tip is just put the key in a little way and turn it, and I'll just make it a bit easier to turn the key. While you can go all the way in one on some frames, others are a bit too hard to do that. Um, this one you could probably go all in one like that because it um, didn't feel too hard to open. Now, 
pretty soon. I can see the honey dripping down already. Let's see if we get a different colour to the other one, which is pretty, pretty exciting. Are there any questions coming in? Yeah, Cedar, um, people were really excited about the new pollinator house and just wondering where's the best place to, to put your pollinator house? Well, it is cute to have them out in the garden like this and you can certainly do that. I've actually found they do better if they've got some shelter. So you could uh, put the screw, that the mounting screw that comes with it into the wall of your house and put it actually under the eave. So it's outside, but it's got some shelter. That The native bees just love that. They'll be in there, they'll be, they'll be using these little tubes and you get a lot more activity I've found than having it out in the garden. But you can do either. Okay, nice. Fantastic. We've got a lighter coloured honey just starting to come down the tube here. So that's exciting, having the, the two different flavours coming in. And that's it, Jay Kimber on Insta is just saying they just set up their flow hive and they're pretty excited. So welcome to the flow community, Jay. Nice one. Now here's it, Naomi's asking, just wondering, should I paint all the pieces of my flow hive before I assemble it? We don't usually advise that because the joins can be quite tight. If you've painted them, then it can be hard to put it together. But if you want to do what is called the wet technique, which a lot of beekeepers do do when they're putting boxes together, you can put it together when the paint isn't dry. And that will give a really good seal in the corners. But it's a lot more messy. So we generally say just paint the outside, leave the inside, just natural for the bees. Except for the shingles. Nice idea to paint them top and bottom. And that way you'll get a bit less um, movement and issues with uh, water uh, getting in. And if you've got the Western Red Cedar, you can use like a decking coat like this one. We find the water-based decking coats from your hardware store are the longest lasting after all these years. And uh, if you've got the Aracaria, then we really recommend painting it. Have some fun with your family like this and put a, put a beautiful picture on the outside. Nice. Cedar, so the new pollinator house um, this year that's launched, is it the Western Red Cedar or the Aracaria? So it's the Western Red Cedar this time. We've, we've scraped around and found enough offcuts of the Western Red Cedar. So what we do is we, we get all the little panels. This one's actually the Aracaria one from last year, but it's the same thing. Um, and sometimes you'll find this panel will be in two pieces. It just um, depends on what we can make out of what we have available. You'll also find things like there might be a flow hive handle on the outside if there's been a rejected flow hive panel like this. And it's all part of the project. The idea is we're upcycling our waste and raising funds for our really important pollinators. Um, Sophie has tuned in on YouTube. Um, Sophie, I'm not quite sure where you are, but just wondering what time of the year should I start my flow hive? So it really does depend a little bit on what's, how much forage is available. So here we can just about start any time of year because we're in the subtropics and there's always some forage around. So we could get a t take, a, take a split almost any time of year. Having said that, spring is often the very best time because you've just got a lot of things flowering at once. So pretty much unanimous, unanimously all around the globe, spring is the busiest season for bees, a great time to start. But there's also other times of year that are good to start as well, depending on where you are in the world. So some local knowledge is key. Obviously, if you're in a really cold, snowy place, you wouldn't be starting in, in winter. But in a lot of areas, you can, you can start throughout any, any of the warmer months. Okay. Look at this, got this beautiful dark honey, and then this, this honey here is a lot lighter. I'm just going to have a little taste of that, <laughs> just because I can. Oh wow, that's fruity. It's like fruity honey, and this one's all malty. Got malty and fruity today. It's amazing <laughs> the different flavors, and that just comes from different flowers. So if you look at this, we've got two quite different color tones and two quite different flavors to match. It's um, really neat. Oh wow, beautiful. 
Now, Jay Kimber, who came in on that question, just got the flow hive. It could have been my internet, but the rest of their questions just come in. Just wondering, so they moved out their hive into a cardboard box into the flow hive last night, um, but we ended up taking out four frames of the brood box and putting the existing comb in a pile in the brood box. Jay's question is, do we need to go back in and fix it? The answer is yes, you don't want a big mess in your brood box, it has to be serviceable and it's a legal requirement to maintain your beehive in such a way that you can remove frames. So if you have a big pile of comb in there, they're likely just to join it all to the frames and you can't lift the frames out and inspect for pests and disease, which you will need to do periodically in the bottom box here. So what you want to make sure you're doing is putting all of your frames in. So remove that pile of wax you have dumped in there, unless it's just a small amount, in which case they, they might be able to use it to recycle onto the frames. But remove that, make sure all of your frames are in there once the bees go in, because if they find a, a, a big blank space, what they'll do is just build random comb, just as if they're in a tree hollow. It won't be in straight lines, which we need to be able to pull the frames out. So all your frames in, any excess space on the sides, and that's the, the good recipe. So um, that uh, will make sure you're in the best place for them to build nice straight cone. Look at that. Better switch that jar over. Gorgeous. Yum, yum. Amazing how much honey they produce, isn't it? It's incredible. And the two different colours, that's so great to be able to see that today, see the, the different flow frames. And I guess that's what's amazing about the flow hive, isn't it? Really being able to extract your different flavours rather than blending them all together. You know, it was a bit of an unexpected thing that happened where um, we didn't set out to make a system that could isolate the flavours in a hive. And we set out with plumbing ideas where we were going to plumb multiple hives into tanks and things like that. When my father and I were inventing over the decade, we had got all sorts of um, drawings. And if you have a look at the original crowdfunding video, we had a row of 10 hives all hooked up to a big pipe and things like that. And that was um, a bit of a surprise when we realised what a benefit it is to be able to isolate one flavour from another and really enjoy the story you bring to the table of the different flavours. It's just so stark between the two. And uh, that always brings up amazing conversations of how bees make honey and all the rest of it. And just so enjoyable to have the different flavours, yeah. if you love honey as much as I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to think what I'm going to make for lunch today with the multi-flavour and the fruity flavour. Yes, yeah, Trace, <laughs> Trace has some beautiful flavours coming in. She's, about um, 20 kilometres from here and just that distance makes an incredible difference to what flavours of honey she's got. So she'll bring in her honey from her hives and she'll bring in her honeycomb. It's really different to um, what we're getting here. So it's a special thing. Your local flavours from your place will be unique. Fantastic. Chuck's just tuned in our ambassador saying that he's got, um, you know, loving the idea that we use our leftover timbers and upcycle them to make the pollinator houses. And he's got two pollinator houses on the side of his house and local leaf cutter and mason bees seem to love the pollinator house. Great. The leaf yeah. cutter bees are quite interesting. What they'll do, and you might see this in certain plants that they like, you see these big bits like a monstrous caterpillar has been munching the edge but it's actually a bee. And what they do is they, they, they get there with their mandibles and they will cut, like with using them like scissors, a little area out of the leaf. They will fly with that back to, to a place like this where they've got a, a hole to use and they will fold that up in there so they've got a little cosy wrapping for their young when they hatch out of their eggs. Pretty cool. Beautiful. Nice. Um, Insta question coming in. I think the question is, do Australian bees sound different? I don't know if they mean different. I don't know. Do they have different accents? I don't know. They're European honeybees, aren't they? Yeah, they get up in the morning and they uh, <laughs> say, yeah, hey, how's it going, mate? And they head out the front and see what's going on. <laughs> no, interestingly enough, 
it brings about a point of the language that the honeybees use. All of the Apis mellifera species, which is the European honeybees, humans have dragged all around the world with them wherever they go, they speak the same language. So you could mix bees from Europe with these bees here and they would instantly understand each other and their language is a dance and other things in the hive but the, the dance is something that humans have learnt to decode but I believe we've got a long way to go to understanding everything they are saying and I just find it so fascinating that in the dark of a hive in amongst 50,000 bees they are able to communicate via movement really accurate information. The waggle is about that uh, one second of waggle e equals about 750 meters of distance. So you see their waggle and stop, waggle and stop. That's how far away the forage is, the nectar or the pollen. How enthusiastic they waggle is how good it is, how much there is available. And the axis of their figure of eight dance you can use to the angle of the sun to work out what direction to go in. But my observations personally are they tell a lot more information than that, like exactly what window to go into to find the mess of honey I used to have when I was extracting in the conventional way in my shed. You close that window and they're really confused even though there's another one just a few meters away. It takes the scout bees to go back to the hive, say no, it's the other window. And an hour or two later, they've found the other window and in they stream again. So somehow they're able to really convey an incredible uh, amount of information that we don't even understand yet, the dance of the honeybee. Beautiful. Uh, Mark's tuning in from the Gold Coast and just wondering if we ever have any issues with water dragons. Uh, Mark saying he gets about three or four of them. They sit under his landing board eating the bees at night. He's wondering he might have to put a fence around his flow hive. Ah, <laughs> we've got water dragons here, but I haven't seen any issues from them. And I guess we've got a lot of bees and I kind of think fair, fair's fair when you get native species eating a few bees. It's um, probably, probably a good thing, seeing as humans have taken away so much habitat. Uh, but of course, you as the beekeeper need to look after your bees. So if the colony is suffering and you notice the numbers dwindling and the hive is getting weak, then you do need to do something about it. You might need to raise it up a bit higher off the ground so uh, they get less, less bees. Um, or perhaps um, you need to increase the size of the landing board, for instance, so that bees don't drop off at night for the water dragon to eat. So, a couple of ideas there. Fantastic. Um, Cedar, are honeybees bad for the environment? A question coming in. So, like most things, there's a, a long complicated answer to that. If you were a owl, for instance, you might say, yes, honeybees are annoying because they're taking up a nest hollow that I wanted. And so you do get various different groups arguing about bee species and what's right and what's wrong. So all of it's important conversation to be having. And I guess my answer is it's really important now as humans to look after our European honeybee. We've got a pollination crisis here coming up in Australia as 30,000 hives have been burnt to uh, try and eradicate the varroa mite. And there's been baiting, so wild colonies have died out. And then we have the varroa mite moving in and that will likely kill a lot of the wild co colonies. So we're expecting quite a pollination crisis. And without enough pollinators, we don't get enough uh, produce. So humans and honeybees are really quite intertwined now and we need to look after them, which means we need enough beekeepers, we need enough hives. And lucky for us, you can rebuild stocks quickly. You can take splits and really build up uh, hives again if you need to. Now, it's also important to think deeper than just are they being a nuisance to another species? <laughs> because what honeybees, need is habitat 
And what other species need is also habitat. So when you get people becoming new beekeepers and when you get people advocating for bees, then what you get is what is really one of the most important things in the, in the world and that is people advocating for habitat. So the real problem is, do we have enough habitat to look after all of our species considering we're having what is the sixth mass extinction. We're losing insect species um, faster than we're even aware of. So for me, if you look at what this produce is and what a jar of sugar is and you, you choose as a consumer whether you have this sweetener or you have the sugar, then well, a, teaspoon, or a jar of this means we need a variety of forage around. Our bees aren't going to be happy and healthy unless they have a varied diet just like us. And the best varied diet is when there's a lot of species around. So you look down here, this is a varied diet. You've got all of these tree species around and when they flower, th that means your honeybees are able to collect the nectar and pollen and have a healthy diet and thrive. If you don't have that, then they get sick. If you have a monoculture, they get sick because they don't have a varied diet. So what the honeybees need is this beautiful biodiversity and that's what all species need. So if you compare that to a jar of sugar, what sugar needs is a monoculture and there's some lasting sugar cane going on down in the valley here. And if you have a look, the drains are polluted. There's really not much life apart from a few pests there. There is no biodiversity. So one, being sugar, when you eat that and consume that, the effect of that is monoculture, species loss, polluted drains, you know, not a great thing for our planet actually. Whereas a jar of honey, promotes biodiversity, forest. And if we were to say, how can we repair our world? One of the key things we need to do is change our agricultural practices. Most deforestation and loss of biodiversity is from our agricultural land use. So if we can find ways to be able to farm when we have a biodiverse landscape, then that is key to the survival of so many species in the world and eventually us. So honeybees are a perfect example of that because what we get is this advocacy for wild spaces, for biodiversity, and a way that we can farm when there is habitat for all. So thinking deeply about that question, I believe European honeybees are a wonderful thing for the environment and agriculture going forward, not only for our own food production, but for the biodiversity that's needed for them and the flow and effect that that gives for so many other species that are on the brink of extinction. And that's why here at Flowhive, we really put a lot of attention into creating habitat. So if anyone's tuned into the beekeeper.org, that one's a 50% of profits donated and we've already planted one and a half million trees to create literally billions of blossoms for not only our native bees, our European honeybees, but all of the creatures that need that biodiversity. And we do countless projects now around the world, really uh, with funds like from our pollinator houses, we've supported so many things and to create uh, pollinator corridors, to educate about honeybees, you name it, we've been doing it for years now. And it's really important to us that we're, we're thinking holistically and looking after uh, all species. And we do that by uh, creating education with our little pollinator houses. And that's actually on sale today. If you do want to have a look at that, it's a little project, but regardless of whether you get our pollinator house or not think about the little native bee species that make the world go round. Create some habitat in your garden. Put away the insecticides. Get out the habitat. It's a wonderful thing that we can all have a real effect in our backyard. 
Fantastic, Cedar. Um, build Reputation is asking when they get the little cute pollinator house, can they build it themselves? Absolutely. So it comes with a little tool, and I'll show you how that works actually. If I do have that little tool handy, you got one there. I'm always losing it. <laughs> And that's why we've got this caddy so I can find it. <laughs> um, so uh, it comes with a tool like this. So it's a nice little tool that you'll want to keep for all sorts of things because you can fit these little screwdriver bits in it. And it comes with a, a uh, Phillips and a square, I believe. But it's the square drive we're using here where um, it's Western Med Cedar, this new one. So it's quite easy just to put them in by hand. A drill will make it quicker, but you can also just do it like this with your kids to put in the screws like this and it's a fun little project that people love to do and then it comes with all the bamboo ready to go cut to size so all you need to do is build the shape follow our little online how to video and uh, pop in these these um, pieces of bamboo like this there's a mounting screw on the back that goes in this little hole it's a longer screw that comes with the pack you put that into the wall of your house on the outside under a nice eave and that's the perfect shelter that they love and you'll notice all of these native bee species coming to use them and all sorts of pollinators. Great educational thing for your family. Fantastic seeds. Maybe now, because we've got a few different bundles that we're launching, we've got different bundles here in Australia and a couple of different bundles um, in the US. Um, and the bundle in Australia, there's a, we'll all be shipping it towards the end of year on the film. The other one is there's a pollinator booster bundle, and that's the, the you can get the um, pollinator house and the gardening kit as well, which is fantastic. And then there's a great junior pollinator power pack, um, which comes with a beautiful hat and veil, the Flow Hive organic cotton hat and veil, and that amazing book that we have called the Book of Bees that's all like animation kids and it's fantastic. So that's the three bundles um, available here in Australia today. So they'll be great prezzies or gifts. And then the one in the US is the pollinator bundle, which is basically the pollinator house and the garden tool set. Um, and that will also ship towards the end of October. So just check out honeyflow.com or .com.au and you'll see these fabulous bundles on sale. Great, and a, and a great fundraiser for our native bee species. Uh, we, we love to do projects, so if you want to jump in and support and join in, then by building one of these and putting it in your yard, you'll be building uh, habitat, advocating for native bee species really important things to be doing. This book here is by um, James Dory who grew up just down the road here actually. This really incredible book. It's one of my favourites because what he does is takes thousands of photos of native bees and stitches them all together to get what is an incredible high definition picture of the native bees. So if you're a, a, a budding bee nerd then this is a great book to have because you just get so much definition. I mean, look at that, super cool. And um, it really highlights just how many native bee species we have. And I flipped through here and so many I've never even heard of. So it's fantastic that he's been documenting for so long and able to really show the different bee species in such an incredible way. Here's a native bee species that, that uh, does actually have a colony so that's called the sugar bag bee and it's uh, still harvested in traditional ways so we have the oldest living culture here in Australia of honey harvesting and they are still harvesting in the traditional ways where they tie a little hair or feather to one of these bees and they follow it back to the nest and they're able to then rob the honey that way just in the wild Look at these pictures, just incredible. Wow, so beautiful. Um, so to Randall Lane's tuning in, and this is a question I get off, asked quite a lot on the phones actually. Randall's wondering, he's in East Tennessee, can you order one of the flow hives already painted like the one you're harvesting from today? The answer is no. You'll have to commission somebody to do that for you. Uh, just shipping wise, 
and logistics, it's very hard once it's all assembled to get a decent shipping price and all of that. So it is a put together project, which is which most people love. They're doing it with their family and so on. And you, having a drill makes it a bit easier, but you can do it and people do do it by hand with the tool we were showing earlier. And it's a case of just uh, the minimum you need to put together to get started is this bottom box and the base and then the roof. And um, if you want to break it up into sessions like that, then you can do your super later as your bees get uh, busy in your hive and they're ready for the top box. Fantastic. Cedar, when you harvest honey, do you need to take it all out of the flow hive of each frame? No, we can just harvest a little bit. For instance, if we had have just put this tool in just uh, this far, let's assume we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six of these jars of this lighter colour. Then if we divided this into six, then that would be about that much would be one jar worth. And we could leave the rest for the bees. So you just put it in that far and turn it and you just get one jar of honey. So if you're not sure, the flow frames are quite versatile like that. If you're not sure whether you need to leave more for the bees, then just go ahead and harvest a little bit, enough for your family, and just see what the bees are doing. Tune in with them, watch the windows. The window is a wonderful tool to be able to tell what's going on in your hive and whether it's time to harvest or not. Fantastic. Green Raisins um, tuned in on Insta and saying, and I think we've probably, we've watched it a few times, the new David Beckham, and he starts and he's harvesting honey. Um, and he's just mentioned it that he calls it the DB sticky stuff um, from David Beckham on the new film he's bought out. How amazing <laughs> is that? It's uh, an incredible thing to have bees and flow hives shown in homes all around the world. It's such amazing advocacy and having people in prominent positions is super important to just really spreading the plight of the bee and how important it is that we have beekeepers going forward. If you look at the USA, for instance, if you dial back 40 or 50 years, there was 200,000 beekeepers. And that, those numbers halved, and then there was 100,000 beekeepers. So the pursuit of beekeeping was in trouble, you might say. And lately, I'm happy to say, people are getting more inspired to take up beekeeping again. And through that, we get advocacy for bees. We get wonderful um, bee nerds that go on to study and discover all sorts of fascinating things. And we're already seeing that in our eight year journey of getting flow hives out into the wild. So super cool to have David there um, harvesting his hives and, and really showing off bees in, um, in Europe there. And also Jamie Oliver has been showing off his hives and harvesting honey for his kids' toasts and all of that in Europe as well. Another really important thing about that is for some reason in Europe, uh, in the beginning, there was a decision made by the beekeepers, I don't know why, that flow hives won't work in Europe. And uh, of course it's not true, we have lots of flow hive beekeepers in Europe, but that still circulates. So it's great to, to see those myths being busted with, um, with the Jamie Olivers and David Beckhams of the world really, really um, getting some limelight on harvesting flow hives in Europe. Right. Vic Dogs is asking, are all bees affected by the Varroa tick or is it just one species? So it is just Apis mellifera, the native bee species as far as we know. I mean, Varroa has never been in Australia, so we don't know yet, but around the world, it is specific to Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. So we are hopeful that it won't cross over from the European honeybee to other native bee species. And the Varroa mite is something that people have been battling for the last 30 years in other countries, and they get along just fine. There's, there's hundreds of, you know, hundreds of thousands of beekeepers in the world, world keeping bees with varroa mites. So it's a new learning curve for us here in Australia, as we expect it to spread from New South Wales throughout the country. Great. Event Zero on YouTube is asking, can you get honey? Can you get wax from the flow hive? 
Yes, you can. You can collect honeycomb, you can collect wax. So down the bottom here in the bottom box, all we give them is a wooden frame. They make the comb themselves just as they've done for the last, you know, several hundred thousand years. And it's, um, we promote very natural beekeeping, no foundation, uh, no plastic foundation down here. It's just wood and wax. Of course, you can do it how you want. You can put plastic foundation, plastic, fully drawn plastic frames in the bottom if you wish. It all works, um, but what we like to do is keep it perfectly natural down here, and that means you can easily cut out some honeycomb from one of these side frames. It's usually honey on the edges. You can cut the whole lot out, which if you dial back several live videos, you'll see it, us doing that live. You can then enjoy that honeycomb, collect the wax and so on, or you could make um, a space in your roof by um, getting, say, a Pyrex dish, get a clear one because it looks cool. You take the little plug out of underneath here and uh, you're able then to put a, a, a glass dish is nice or you could use a plastic one if you want to and the bees will get up there and make some comb in this area. You can just take the plug out, let them use the whole roof. That's fun for a while but uh, you know it gets a bit messy to clean up so confining them to a smaller space is nice and you can then collect honeycomb and wax and make candles with these kids and all of that. Fantastic seed. I meant to throw this one at you as you had that roof off. Gigi um, has just saying that they were building the hive and they were having problems fitting the roof on the inner cover. And I thought you could talk about how you, when you build the roof, so they're going to pull the roof apart, how you build it, don't you, like around the inner cover. Okay, yes, I've got a tip for that. If you have a look yeah. at our assembly video, it'll show you how to do that. And we've probably even got a fixed video. Yeah. But the way we do it, is that in a cover we sit it in here and that gives us a square and saves us going and finding one in our workshop and it's and it's fit for shape what we do is we push it against that edge and we push it against that edge and then we do up the wing screw to hold it do that one all the way up and it'll push it over and that holds that frame square while you put the roof shingles on now if you have put it together without doing that and it happens to be out of square then the fix for it is to take off these shingles here. You'll be able to get it back to looking good, don't worry. Uh, you, you take out these um, screws, square up the frame by putting the inner cover in and pushing it over to one side. Then, uh, because when you put the screws back, they will follow the holes that are already there. What you need to do is just put a matchstick down the hole which is in the gabled bit and snap it off and do that in those places where the screws have gone through. And what that'll mean is the screw will find a new hole. So a great little trick to um, fix an outer square roof. Fantastic, hopefully that'll help you Gigi. Um, now Brody stalled a nuke a couple of weeks ago on their hive, was all excited, but they did their first inspection on the weekend and the bee, it was a bit of a disaster, the bees were really cranky, they used the smoker and everything. Uh, Brody's asking, what advice do you have for them, what should they do next? Okay, if the bees are, uh, remain being cranky and that's not useful for you or you'd pref really prefer they weren't cranky, then the thing to do is locate the queen, take her away, wait a day, and insert a new queen from a queen breeder that has known genetics. A month later, you'll have a completely different temperament because all of those forager bees that were, that were on the guard bees would have died by then and a new genetics will take over. It really is wonderful to have calm genetics that you can work with. I had very aggressive genetics for uh, most of my life until I realized you could have calm ones. <laughs> and now what we do is periodically we get some new genetics coming in by ordering in some queens. And um, we don't usually requeen all our hives like the commercial beekeepers do. We just will requeen the ones that are getting a bit grumpy or perhaps one's lost its queen. And that way we're just inserting some gentle genetics back into the gene pool in the area. So replacing the queen, but you might just find you got them on a bad day. Um, perhaps there was a mower that stirred them up and they were upset, or perhaps it was a bit too windy or it was a gray day and they were feeling depressed, who knows, but check it. Um, 
and if you're fine ongoing, they have aggression which is bothering you, then go ahead and replace your queen. If that's too much of a daunting job for you to find the queen and take her away, then get some help from an experienced beekeeper. Great. JP Levitt is asking, Cedar, other than when cutting out honeycomb and transferring your frames, you're talking about the brood box, are there any other times when you should rotate your frames in the brood box? So it depends on your spring management techniques. So come springtime, bees build up. It's their natural thing to build up. And if the genetics are there, they're likely to swarm. And what you want to do is get ahead of the curve and take splits and every time you take a split you're swapping out half of the frame so that's a great way to rotate frames you're constantly inserting new ones in the springtime if you um, don't want to do that then yes there is techniques to rotate the frames in your brood box come spring management let's say your your techniques were not to take splits then you might decide that what you want to do is take some honey away from the edge and replace those blank frames back in towards the centre. And that pushes the ones in the centre that have been through perhaps a few brood cycles out towards the edges and then there's a natural cycle out. Now if you're using natural foundation like we promote, all you have to do is pull up that edge frame, check it doesn't have any brood on it and just cut it out right there in the field, cut out the wax and put the frame straight back in towards the centre. It's a great way to rotate the old wax out and also give new real estate for your queen to lay eggs on and that'll relieve that primary swarm trigger. Now, if you find that you want to pull a frame out of the edge for rotating it out purposes and it has got a little bit of brood on it but not much, then one clever little trick you can do is take that frame out place back in a spare, assuming you have one, and put that frame on its side under the roof, prop it up with a few little sticks so it's not pressing on the inner cover, and take the inner cover plug out and put your roof back on. That will allow that remaining brood to emerge. The nurse bees will come up and look after it, and the queen won't be able to lay any eggs because of your queen excluder, and what you'll find is uh, a couple of weeks later you've got no brood and you can take that frame away, cycle it out. So a little trick there, if you do end up with brood in one of the frames you're trying to cycle. Great. Brad's asking if I were to buy, uh, to get a flow hive, will the bees basically seek it out themselves or do I have to purchase bees as well? Rarely. What you're talking about there is a bait hive and it's fun to set up if you've got a location with lots of hives and I've had it work and I've had it fail a lot as well where you can set up your hive and it's nice to set it up 6 or 12 feet off the ground and near a whole lot of current uh, busy hives and what you'll find if it's springtime is there's lots of swarms uh, around and you might just be lucky that one of them decides that your hive is a great home and they move right in. But I wouldn't want to rely on that. Better to buy in some bees from a queen breeder in a nuke, which is a going little hive. All you need to do is get your smoker and your bee suit out and transfer them into your bottom box, look after them and they'll grow. Or you could take a split from a friend. So often in the springtime especially you'll be helping someone by taking a few brood frames out from here. That gets your colony going, leaves the swarming trigger for them as well. And it's great learning if you can learn alongside an existing beekeeper too. Right. Jodie's question is, can you split a hive and keep both of the hives on your property? Absolutely. So we um, could double these hives in spring if we wanted to, just by splitting them all. And it, it's, um, we, we did take a whole lot of splits of all the busy hives, and we've got a lot more hives down the bottom here now. So it is something that beekeepers do is just split their hives and you can put it right beside the other one or you can move it across your yard whatever you like you've got uh, a couple of videos in live streams showing you how to do splits also have a look at the beekeeper.org where we take you through from a beginner right through to a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping and it's an online course that gets rave reviews also raises funds for planted 
oh, uh, 1.5 million trees now from that to create billions of blossoms for bees and habitat for all. So have a look there if you do want to handhold as you learn. Otherwise, ask me this time of the week or have a look at our live streams and our videos and make sure you're um, uh, just getting, getting the techniques and are able to feel comfortable in taking those splits. Right, um, Jody. oh no, Alexandra's asking, can you put a flow super on top of a regular Langstroth deep box? Absolutely, you know, we thought that most people would want to do that. When we launched our video in 2015, you'll notice it was mainly tailored towards existing beekeepers. But what we didn't realise was that half our audience would be brand new to beekeeping. So we thought people would just love to uh, get our flow frames, put them on their hive, and we even supplied templates and cutouts, which are still there somewhere. So you can just buy the frames and insert them into a conventional Langstroth beehive if you want to. And you can insert a few in the middle, which we call the hybrid, or you could do the full rack like this. But what we found is people actually prefer the whole setup. And then over time, we we put more and more features into the hive. So I really do recommend getting the whole hive if you can, because now we've got integrated pest management built in. We've got a screen bottom board. It's all set up so it can be tilted backwards and there's no issues with um, water getting in the entrance like you get with a conventional Langstroth hive. And that way you can maintain the tilt the whole time. You can walk up and harvest like this without having to fiddle around and change the angles. And it also makes this little leak back point, which is an important little thing work properly when the frames are maintained on that three degrees slope. So um, if you can, get the whole thing, but um, if you do want to experiment with the frames, go ahead. We all also love to see people's wacky experiments where they're inserting their frames into their top bar hives and into tree trunks and wall cavities just for fun. So, uh, so by all means, you can grab our fly frames, you can grab it with the super box, or you can get the whole lot kit and caboodle with a bundle as well with your bee suit, smoker, caddy uh, and all the wing dings. <laughs> Maggie's asking, um, just wondering at what sort of it's been asked, but will Flow Hive be doing any videos on how to test for Varroa mite? Uh, yes, we've posted a few uh, videos already, so um, just have a look there. Probably the DPI is the best one to look at, where they go through how to do a sugar shake and an alcohol wash. We did one on the sugar shake here, which was a live stream, which you can probably find. Um, but yes, Varroa mite is new to us here in Australia, so we're all learning together, but lucky for us, we've got every other continent except uh, Antarctica, I guess, has the Varroa mite and it has a wealth of knowledge about how to manage it. Right, Zach, this is, a, this is a question we get quite a lot as well. Zach would love to buy a flow hive but has really no idea on how to do anything at all and finds it a little bit intimidating. Yes. I guess tips and tricks for getting started seeds with a, with, a, with a beehive, a flow hive. Yes, so it depends which way you like to start. So people like to learn in different ways but the important thing is you are learning and I'm the kind of person that likes to just jump in and do something and learn as I go and I'll usually draw on online resources to learn. Other people will like to read a few books first, other people will like to do a physical um, training workshop which are available in some areas where they teach you about um, beekeeping uh, but depending on which way I mean I just recommend jumping in, putting your hive together, going and getting your bees. Beekeeper.org is a great um, is a great training resource or we've got lots of, uh, that's the beekeeper.org, um, lots of resources here on our live stream and on our YouTube channel as well for you to draw on. Andy's asking Cedar, what's the usual time for a swarm to settle in and fill the box and start the process of breeding? So it can happen very quickly. Often swarms are happening in the springtime when there's a lot of nectar available. And if you've got a strong colony and it's a really big swarm, we've seen them fill an entire box of honeycomb in two days and they're already up and running and really ready for a super on top. However, yeah, 
also get small swarms or you get issues where there's not enough nectar and it's slow. And then you just have to be patient and wait as they build up and start building their comb in each frame in the bottom box here. And then eventually they should get going. Now, occasionally you do get an issue where, you've, where it's the old queen that leaves, right? And she could be starting to fail as in she's not laying enough eggs to get enough of a population to really bring in a lot of honey. So if that's the case, other beehives are doing really well, but the swarm you've caught isn't, then you might like to replace the queen in that uh, and really get some virile egg laying happening and get your colony building a bit quicker. Fantastic, Cedar. Um, Vic Dogs, another question. I'm not sure if we mentioned this before. Just wondering if you want to put the pollinator house in your garden, how far off the ground should it be? Ah, uh, yes, I would keep it off the ground because you might get um, ant issues. We have these termites here that'll eat wood. Um, so you don't just want it straight on the ground. So we do have a, um, a mounting point here. So a great thing to do would be put in a, a, um, a stake into the ground with a bit of wood on it or a wooden stake uh, and you can get the longer screw and you just simply put that in the stake and you hang it here just as you would on the wall and that'll get it off the ground. Alternatively you could just put a rock or a, a big tall brick and put it on that as well in your garden but yeah good idea. If you are getting a pollinator house which is uh, this is the time of year. We've got it on sale now. It's upcycled from our waste and it's a fundraiser. The idea is it's an educational thing and a, a great thing for you to and your family to learn about the native bee species in your area. So if you are getting one of these, then uh, yes, as you say, mount it off the ground and it'll last longer. Another sweet jar of honey here. Isn't that just gorgeous and I think we've just about run out. We have a couple of oh. these little jars. Oh. <laughs> Bumper harvest today. This hive is amazing. I wonder if we can um, swap it out for one of these little ones. It's beautiful to harvest into these tiny ones. You can move the shelf up a, a screw here, harvest into these small ones, which is a fantastic thing to do at a wedding. I've done it a few times where you, I've actually brought a whole hive with bees in it and harvested into jars like this and every guest takes home a beautiful little jar of honey from the wedding. So it's a, it's a nice thing to do if you've got a lot of people to give honey to. Look at that. Oh. It's only two frames out of seven here. And look how much honey we've got already. Well, don't let Charlie know. He'll be, you know, Charlie will be grabbing it for his roadside store. That's right. He's been <laughs> running around bothering the neighbours, selling them honey, which they love. Um, oh, this one's a bit full on. Robert, um, Robert Lang saying they just found out their neighbouring paddock is about to be sprayed with insecticide and they're really worried about their hive and, you know, that they may have a um, classic hive because he's worried about the openness of the bottom of the hive. Just wondering, should he shut the bees inside and block the bottom up or what's the best thing to do? You can do, yeah. Insecticide issues can be nasty for bees and if they're spraying onto flowers, which um, sometimes they are to control pests, then they should be following the guidelines for pollinators, which are to um, spray on a non-windy day, spray in the evening when all the bees are home. That way it's got all night to um, deactivate before pollinators are foraging the next day. Now, in, in theory, that's better for the bees, but of course we prefer they're not really getting any insecticide at all. Uh, so, as you say, you could um, block up your bees. Now, if you do block up your bees while they're spraying, which is an option you can do, then just make sure they have a lot of ventilation. Take your tray out or your core flute slider, as you've got the classic, take it out, leave a lot of ventilation there. It won't be the spray drift that is the problem for them. It will be foraging on flowers that are sprayed. So have a look at that too. Perhaps they're spraying when things aren't flowering and that would be a better, a better issue. Having said that, sometimes the spray will go on to forage that's on the ground. You might have weeds underneath that are flowering. The spray could get on them. 
So as you say, it could be a good idea to block them up. Now, if it's hot, it's a hot time of year and you've got a lot of um, uh, sun on your hive, then you might need to give them a little bit of shade as well. What you don't want them to do is overheat. If they don't have uh, the ability to ventilate, then you, if it's a hot time of year, they could actually overheat in the hive and um, die. But the other huge one is ventilation. So make sure they've got the full screen bottom board, lock them up in the early morning, and none of those bees will be out of forage that day, which could be a helpful thing. I wouldn't leave them more than a day um, because they can just get a bit stressed. I've done all sorts of displays with hives and I have noticed that when I've taken bees onto the TEDx stage and things like that, taking them home, they can get a bit stressed and that's just blocking them up for a day. Um, and what they'd start to do is ejecting the brood and you see a whole lot of young larvae being hauled out the front. They survived and the queen was fine and they prospered again, but it's just something to be wary of that does cause stress, blocking them up for the day. Um, so be mindful for not too long. Yeah. Thanks, Ada. And I've got to do a shout out to Sue. I'm probably saying the name wrong. Suvu is just joining us from Fiji. Love that country. Excellent. I've got family in Fiji, actually, keeping flow hives uh, near Nandi. And um, they've made some great little videos of um, harvesting or drone shots of their farm, taking honey into the Bulacino, which you might know in Nandi. And uh, yeah, we've visited a number of times there. It's um, a beautiful place with uh, lots of forage around for the bees. So thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Um, we've got time for a, a couple more questions. Fantastic. Just one, Ebart's just wondering, is taking honey away from the bees, um, is it damaging to the bees? The answer is it could be if the bees are hungry. So you'll get tuned in with what's going on by looking at these windows and see whether bees are storing honey or eating honey. If you have a look here, this is the time of year where they're storing honey. Everything is capped because they start getting hungry. You'll notice random cells being eaten out and just there'll be empty cells then. And then they might, nectar might come again. You'll see uh, they're glinting nectar down those empty cells. So as you tune in with that, you'll know when it's good to harvest and when to leave some for the bees. And if you have a long time without flowers, like a typical long winter ahead, then leave uh, honey for the bees. Find out for your local beekeepers how much honey they need. And if they don't have enough, feed them in the last months before winter to get them to at least store some sugar syrup so they can survive through that long winter. Here in the subtropics, we don't need to worry about that. We can harvest honey all year round. Great thing is with the flow hive is if you are unsure, it's pretty easy just to take a little bit of honey. And we've only taken two out of seven frames today and gotten all of this honey. So there's still plenty left for the bees. But you can also take part of a frame just by inserting the key a little way like that and turning it. And that might just harvest one sixth of a frame uh, and get a, a nice jar of honey for you without taking very much at all away from your bees. After all, it is their carbohydrate and what they live on and they're storing it for a time with no flowers ahead. Like for us, they store more than they need often and we can share some too, which is the mutually beneficial thing about keeping honeybees. We've got, we give them a nice house, they pollinate their crops and make excess honey that we can share. Fantastic. So do the pollinator houses that we've launched, um, I, one of the questions is how long will they be on sale for and, and how come we don't sell them all year round? So we don't sell them all year round because they are a donation product that we make upcycled from our off cut. So each year we go to the corner of the, uh, of the factory and we collect up all the off cuts and we have a look at how many pollinator houses we can make and we get to work cutting the shingles down, making uh, these parts out of our offcuts. This year it'll be all Western Red Cedar offcuts. So really nice, easy one to put together with the, uh, you can just put it together with the L wrench that comes with the kit, or you can use a drill if you like. 
and we've got videos showing you just how to do that. A little project that just takes a couple of hours with your kids and it's a, a fun little thing and then a great educational thing as well to uh, have it on the side of your house and learn about the different bee species in your area that'll come in and just use these bamboo tubes. You might get fire-tailed resin bees, masked bees, all sorts of bees and if, you, if you're here in Australia then uh, this is a very cool book showing all our native bee species and he's actually found hundreds of bee species in a single tree so it's um, incredible once you tune in with these little insects all the different bee species and the photography in here is just incredible Fantastic. And look, a few people tuning in seeds, and I'll probably have to answer this one for you, is that what is the name of this flower, the purple flower that's surrounding this hive that is so beautiful at the moment? Oh, um, Trace is our key gardener. I know. Now, I'm terrible, but I'm pretty sure it's a salvia when I remember planting them. I think these are all different colours, and um, this one at the moment just looks particularly spectacular. That's look good, doesn't it? Yeah, isn't it? A little look. honeysuckle. <laughs> A beautiful little honeysuckle for the kids too. Yeah. You can get out here and compete with the bees. The bees love them. So flowers like this will be hard for um, European honeybees because they're, um, they're trumpet shaped and they're too big to get down. But some of our native bee species will um, get right down inside these and uh, really enjoy that nectar. So when you plant a garden like this, you're really doing it for our native bee species. What you need for the European honeybee is acres and acres and acres of forage. In fact, these, a hive like this could pollinate 50 million flowers a day. So planting a garden like this won't make much difference to your honey crop, but it will make a big difference to the little native bee species that might only cover a short range, a couple of hundred metres. You'll be providing a stepping stone for them to get from your place down the road and hopefully to the wild space beyond, which might just reintroduce a species of bee that's on the brink of extinction to a wild area where they can prosper. So super important to make homes for our pollinators. Fantastic. Says, well look, here's a, here's a good last question maybe um, from Adams Jenner on um, Instagram. Just wondering, where's the best place to locate a hive on a suburban block and how much space do you need? Okay, the great thing about honeybees is they don't need much space because they're effectively almost like an organism that can spread itself out over the wild spaces and farmland and urban landscapes, collect all that nectar and bring it back into your hive again. So you can just have these on your balcony in, in the city. My sister kept bees in Berlin on a balcony for, for, for years there and uh, got very nice honey. You get all sorts of beautiful honey in urban areas because of the things that people plant in the parks and so on. A lot of forage for bees actually. And uh, if you want them in your backyard, then you just want to choose an area where the flight path isn't going to bother anyone. So here, we've put them near the edge here because we rarely walk down in front. So we can walk along here really being bothered except for on windy days when the bees are getting blown this way. And the bees are all flying out that way to go foraging. So you, you don't uh, get bothered by the bees so much. So think about that when you place your hive, which way the entrance is pointing. Ideally they've got, they can fly up and away. If they hit a fence just this far away, then they'll probably double back and fly the other way, which won't bother the bees, but it, it might not be as good for you. So you're, you choose a position where the flight path isn't gonna bother anyone, that's number one. And uh, number two is, um, it's good to have some sun at least in the morning. Shade in the afternoon and summer would be ideal, but if you're going to choose full sun over full shade, I'd go full sun because you get less issues with pathogens like chalk brood, which can be detrimental to your bees. So sun is good. Thank you so much for tuning in. We do have a special on at the moment. Trace might just give a bit of a wrap on what that's all about. And same time next week, uh, and we'll have something interesting to show you. Let us know if there's anything you'd like us to cover or any questions you have. Yeah, great seed. So the, the pollinator house, there's, you can just buy the pollinator house if you want by itself, or you can bundle and save, and there's some great 
savings there. There's the garden pollinator bundle, which is the one with the beautiful Bees of Australia book and the gardening set. Um, that's the garden pollinator bundle. There's the junior pollinator power pack. A bit Ryan thought of that name. Um, that comes with a really cool, the book of bees, an amazing sort of um, animated book. And they, you get a, a um, Flow Hive organic hat and veil. And then there's the pollinator booster bundle, which is the pollinator house with the garden tool set. Um, and that's in Australia on the honeyflow.com.au site. And in the US, we have the pollinator bundle, booster bundle pack for sale. Um, they're all going to be shipping towards the end of October. Um, as Cedar said, it's a fundraising project that we do. Um, so get in because they are usually limited. Once they've gone, they've gone until next year we do it again. Thanks, Seeds. Awesome. And these garden tools get a great review because they're so solid. I was sick of garden tools just breaking all the time, but it'd be pretty hard to break these ones. I'd oh. be impressed if you do. They've got very solid um that tool, what is it there. called? It's called a widget, or no, what's it called? It's yeah, that's become a favourite, the widget. That is so good for putting your seedlings in, I love it. And getting weeds out as well. Yep. And it comes in this nice tool wrap, which makes a nice little present too, uh, because you can bundle it up like that. Thank you very much for tuning in, same time next week, 